good morning, everyone on the U.S. side, and then a good evening, everyone from India. Uh, my name is Kedar Pavki. I am the National Capital Region Director at the National Security Innovation Network, which is a part of the Defense Innovation Unit. Our mission is to find commercial technology and help bring it into the department. I am truly honored today to help kick off the Indus X Gurukul Educational Series. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Indus X uh, Gurukul Series uh, is part of the broader Indus X initiative, which is designed to strengthen the partnerships between the US and Indian defense innovation ecosystems. Uh, this specific series is meant to help startups and you know, prospective startups learn about the challenges, uh, the uh, different ways to navigate each uh, country's defense innovation space and learn how to become a better company to help service the defense industrial bases and you know, ultimately become a good uh, company uh, in that space. So with that, we have a fantastic panel today. Um, and I'm actually going to hand it off to Ms. Lauren Badula, our moderator, to introduce the folks on the panel and uh, go from there. So with that, Lauren, over to you. Thank you, Kidar, and good morning and good evening to everyone on the line. Uh, as I was discussing with the panelists, um, as, as we were teeing up today's discussion, um, you know, no better way to spend a Friday, um, but very excited that we have a full 90 minutes today. So we don't have to rush through any topics. We can really get to know each other, um, get to know everything from career stories to how each of these leaders think about investment in the defense ecosystem uh, between our partnerships in the US and India, which is an extremely important partnership. Um, so what I figured I'd do today is start off the conversation by going around to each panelist to have them tell a little bit about their story and what brought them here today, um, and then their organization, of course. And today's focus will really be a lot around the investment ecosystem. So we hope our um, listeners really learn um, how these leaders think about investments in technology, both in the US and India, and how to navigate doing business with the respective defense ecosystems, because we know it's not always the easiest market um, to enter. So um, with that, I'd, I'd love to go around the horn and start um, with uh, Andrew Magliarchetti from Iron Gate Capital Advisors. Andy, if you don't mind diving into your story, um, we'll kick it off here. Yeah, sure. Happy to do so. Uh, thanks, Lauren. Welcome, everyone. Um, why don't I maybe start with, I'll tell you just a minute about Iron Gate, and then I'll tell you sort of about my background and kind of how we how we got here. Um, Iron Gate is an early stage VC investor uh, focused on dual use technologies. Um, we really have a focus on six kind of tech verticals to include cybersecurity, ISR, uh, critical infrastructure protection, space technologies, kind of robotics, unmanned, and hypersonics, and lastly, advanced processing. And we bucket um, AI, quantum, and human machine interface in there. Uh, our team is multidisciplinary from uh, with backgrounds in finance, technology, government service to include the Department of Defense, uh, the intelligence community, and kind of our civil security agencies here in the States. Uh, my background, I live here in Chicagoland, though our fund is based in, in uh, Palm Beach, Florida. Um, I've spent 23 years in the finance world um, and kind of started my career in a different place than the, focused on a different sector than where I am now. Um, I've done, transactions sort of all over the world in the states western europe eastern europe um, asia other places uh, and kind of during that journey as a founder a banker an investor an advisor uh, really sort of grew my relationships with the united states government and other allied governments um, so i've had the luxury along the way to follow my own interests and go back to school a few times for advanced degrees in finance public policy around counterterrorism, and lastly, uh, data science and computational statistics. So that's, in a nutshell, Iron Gate and me. Thank you, Andy. Um, and I, there's lots that we can kind of pull from there, so I'm excited to, to come back to you. Uh, Siddharth, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to pivot to you for your story and um, to tell us a little bit about Invest India as well. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. I hope I'm coming through loud and clear. Uh, thank you for having me uh, here. And uh, I have an interesting story. After 24 years of in industry, in corporate, late last year, I made the transition into government. 
joining Invest India. So I bring a, a mix of, you know, having been in multiple roles, which I'll go through in a minute. Uh, but in this new phase of my life that I am in, I'm working with Invest India, which is India's uh, national investment and trade facilitation agency. Uh, so my role today is uh, how do you create that effective bridge between industry and government in terms of how you understand government better? How do you provide advisory in terms of how do you work with government? How do you facilitate investment, trade, and innovation through various schemes that the government is making available? And then do this at scale so that you can help not just a few companies, but a lot of companies. Now, what brought me to government after 24 years of having been in industry was really uh, to have that, you know, bring that experience to the table so that you could be this effective bridge. I started 24 years back as an R&D engineer working in telecoms. And over the last 24 years, I've done pretty much, you know, I, I moved from being an R&D engineer to doing marketing, to doing business development globally, uh, of which aerospace and defense used to be one of my, my sectors when I was working in Europe, uh, you know, looking at uh, engineering services for an Indian company called Wipro. So that gave me a lot of insight in terms of one, how difficult it is to break into an aerospace and defense market. But at the same time, once you make an entry, you are in it for the long term and it gives rich dividends over a period of time. So that experience and that understanding really, really helped during that part of my, my career. And I've also done roles in business development in India, in Europe, in UK. And then the last eight years of my career was in supply chain, uh, largely at Intel, where I looked at what do you look for in a supplier? What, do, what does a company look for in terms of uh, getting technology, getting subsystems from a, from a vendor? And, and that I think is, is quite a relevant area to have to become part of the global defense manufacturing value chain how smaller companies how new countries that are not part of that value chain what do they need to do and what kind of parameters do you need to uh, you know benchmark yourself with if you have to get into these value chains these supply chains that are very uh, very very strong um, so uh, the experience of of industry and the experience of how do you work in India with the Indian government, which is doing a lot, both for startups and also to look at the defense industrial complex in India. These are areas that, you know, I'd love to discuss more today. And thanks once again for the opportunity. What a fantastic background and so important that you bring perspectives from both the private and public sector, uh, because we have to figure out how to get everyone from both sides to work well together. And I think that cross pollination is a great enabler on that front. Um, I'd like to pivot while we're on the, the government side to uh, Mr. Singh. Jaseet, would you um, please tell folks a little bit about Select USA and, and your background as well? Uh, sure, sure. Hopefully I'm coming through as well. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, uh, Indus X, for organizing this very important program. Uh, as a matter of background, uh, my name is Jaseet Singh, and I'm the executive director of Select USA. Uh, Select USA is uh, housed within the U.S. Department of Commerce, and our mission is to promote and facilitate foreign direct investment into the United States. Uh, I'm really excited to be part of this program, uh, also because uh, some of my background is in India. Immediately before this role, I was at the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, at the U.S. India Business Council. And so I've gotten for in that role about five years the ability to kind of watch closely the uh, economic ties uh, and the geopolitical ties, I think, between our two great countries grow. So this is really, uh, I think, a great uh, and important conversation. And when we, when we bring a defense as the, the topic, um, you know, of focus into it, it becomes all the more important <clears throat> in, a, in an increasingly unstable world uh, where your partners and allies are more important now than ever. Um, I'd love to tell you just really briefly, one of our key programs is uh, the Select USA Tech Program. And this is really how Select USA supports startups that are strategically uh, aiming to connect with investors. Uh, this is a program that connects early stage and startup technology companies to uh, prospects for advancement in the U.S. market. 
this is where we create a space to, to make connections by, by hosting events like virtual webinars, inbound investment missions, as well as our flagship Select USA Investment Summit, which I, I hope uh, some of your uh, listeners may have been, been at. Um, at the Select USA Investment Summit, we provide a tech pavilion to startups in the Select USA Tech program where they present and share and, and they network their products and services. So this is in addition to the Select USA Tech Investment Academy session, which is sort of the latest investment trend and the opportunity of, of key industry subsectors. There's industry pitching sessions for tech startups to provide companies with an opportunity to provide their investment strategies and products in front of uh, a panel of very prestigious uh, venture capitalists, corporate investors, um, industry experts, accelerators, uh, and representatives from the startup ecosystem. So we'll often see international companies either in tech or different sectors connecting with established U.S. companies um, at the investment summit. And that is essentially our bread and butter at Select USA. We're working to create the spaces to allow foreign direct investment into the United States to flourish. How fantastic. Again, I know we have a lot of founders and entrepreneurs on the line and navigating fundraising can be so complicated as especially as we look at trusted partners and, and um, building strong international relationships. So what a fantastic resource. Um, last but certainly not least, I'm gonna pivot back to the investment side and Avinash, I was hoping you could jump in next. Yeah, uh, thanks, Lauren. Uh, I'll give you a background uh, to the firm I belong to first, and then probably personally as well. Uh, so I, I'm part of a firm called Kalari Capital. Uh, Kalari is one of India's oldest uh, VC firms, having started in, I think, 2006. Uh, approximately, we manage about $750 million in asset AUM today. Um, Kalari is primarily a seed to Series B investor. Check sizes go anywhere between 500K to about 5, 6 million as a first check. And we are sector agnostic. Um, we have invested in any, so we like to say that we invested from skin creams to satellites. Uh, right? So we invest across the board. And um, deep tech has been a very big focus for us, uh, which lends itself to applications of defense as well. Uh, and some of our biggest winners uh, from prior funds have been in sectors which have been very nascent. And right now, something which is up and coming is uh, deep tech focused firms uh, who have dual applications in commercial industry as well as defense. All right. So that's a background to the firm. I joined them about six years ago uh, and I work with the investment team here um, in evaluating deep tech opportunities, work with some of our deep tech portfolio as well, um, as well as in other sectors. Uh, personally, I'm from the south of India, which is where most of the um, deep tech defense uh, action happens in India. Um, and I'm, I'm about, say, give or take uh, five, six miles from Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, uh, which is one of the premier kind of defense firms uh, in India. Um, and the south of India um, lends itself very uh, nicely uh, to defense applications. And right now, over the last about two, three years, uh, there's been a significant government push uh, for private players to be suppliers, vendors uh, to Indian defense as well as abroad as well. Uh, so that's been there. And uh, previously, I was a data scientist uh, prior to becoming a VC. And uh, yeah, look forward to the conversation today as well. Fantastic. And just a little bit about myself. So you all see um, my emphasis on the public private partnership piece here is at our firm, Beacon Global Strategies, I lead our national security technology practice, which is focused on advising disruptive technology companies on how to navigate partnerships in business with the national security community. Um, I also serve on the boards of the Silicon Valley Defense Group, uh, the Women's Foreign Policy Group, and Business Executives for National Security. So i um, very interested in how we bring our communities together to work as effectively as possible. Um, and so with that in mind, especially because you all um, represent and work issues around the investment community, I wanted to hear from you about what you look for besides the specific technology areas when you're deciding to make an investment or you're finding um, folks that that might be great partners. Um, how do you think about or approach those investments? Andy, can I put you on the spot? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to go first. <laughs> so um, 
and just to understand the qualification of the question, so we're assuming that we have that you know the technology meets an acute need it, it sort of checks the technology boxes right um i i think in particular in the dual use segment you know when we're evaluating technology investments assuming we have satisfied ourselves on the technology side of the equation you know i would start with kind of philosophical alignment right i mean we're trying to invest in dual use technologies that you know benefit the national security of the us and its allies right so just at the start, if there's not a philosophical alignment, then you know th there's a problem. But uniquely, you know, the go-to-market strategy for these types of technologies is different than sort of traditional, uh, you know, early-stage tech companies. So, really making sure they have a, a clear understanding of how they're going to engage with their prospective customers. Um, how do they? Uh, you know, intend to kind of navigate the various contracting entities, the various vehicles. Do they have the right personnel and the right support resources to do that? Uh, can we help them to bring those resources to bear? Um, so I think that that would be sort of two primary distinctions you know, in this segment versus another. Um, you know, I defer to, to Avinash as well to understand if he has further thoughts too, but I would start there. Yeah, just adding on to that, um, I think our framework probably has three main pillars to it. Um, so the first one, and probably um, we would also look at the technology. And one thing we look at is, um, is it incrementally better than what the incumbents are giving? Or is it, say, uh, exponentially better, like 10 or 100x better, right? Uh, now, particularly for defense ap um, applications and even dual use in some sense. And most of them, uh, I would use a deep tech lens to it. Uh, we've seen that adoption only happens if there is a potential for at least a 25x to a 50x improvement uh, to what the incumbents are offering in terms of either uh, you know efficiency, cost, or any of the other kind of similar parameters. So that's number one. Number two is what we look at founder market fit. Like you can't wake up one day and say you're going to like start such a company, right? You got to have some background to it. Uh, either you worked uh, in a similar space or you studied in a similar space and so on, right? Uh, unlike, say, other sectors where you could theoretically, say, wake up one day and say, I'm going to have a low-code, low, low, low no-code application to start something. In such uh, defense or even dual-use kind of solutions, we've seen that founder market fit where you at least know what the buyer persona is, what the buyer uh, pattern is in terms of how do they make their purchasing decision. Uh, those are important kind of factors for us as well while evaluating an investment decision, uh, right? Uh, so those are the two main things, like probably adding a different flavor to what you just said. Uh, but those are the two main kind of things where we would look at. And the third one uh, we would definitely see is, uh, are you at least giving some sort of cost advantage, uh, right? Uh, primarily because we've seen that in the current day and age, uh, cost is becoming a significant factor in the purchasing decision um, in larger organizations. Uh, so th those are three main things we're looking at uh, when we are evaluating any investment. Uh, which has a defense angle to it um, uh, here. Uh, uh, just last thing to add on, um, the dual use comes into play primarily because of a de-risking factor, right? Because in case you don't get adopted by, say, defense buyers, right? Uh, you must have alternate buyers in order to make sure that the company is a going concern. Um, and that's where that is. But if you do have significant inroads into defense applications only, and you know what you're doing, that also works for us, right? But the dual use kind of structure is essentially for us a de-risking strategy um, in the event that, you know, you're not able to crack your defense contracts. Avinash, I, I would agree that it's an important statement that the solution needs to be significantly but, and often dramatically better than the incumbent. Let's let's think about sort of the the, the customer and if the acquisition officer is taking some sort of risk versus the incumbent, right? It's easy. There's very little risk to to stick with the the legacy technology that works, but maybe doesn't work as well. So there has to be that incentive there to, you know, to bring a new vendor on board for that solution, and it needs to be around the efficacy, the cost, and ideally both, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is beyond the technology itself. For a company to be successful, you really need the human aspect, the talent, the team, the workforce, which I'm, I'm sure we can chat about today. 
and also a business plan and model, which I'd like to come back to as well to talk about best practices when it comes to going to market, um, particularly when you think about international dynamics, navigating compliance, um, navigating teaming and the like. But before I do that, I want to go back to this idea of thinking from the perspective of a founder or an entrepreneur who is going out to fundraise. I think those are great best practices for them to think about highlighting beyond their technology. Um, but the mechanics of the fundraising itself, um, I see founders most often think about venture capitalists or private capital and investors. And I'd love to hear more about Invest India and Select USA and how entrepreneurs actually access and, and come find you and go through the process to be evaluated. Um, Siddharth, may I start with you? Yeah, yeah, sure. And thank you for that question. And you know, I think the role that we play as Invest India is to enable these conversations where, you know, if we go back to the first question where a, a company or a new company or a startup has the idea, thinks that it's dramatically better than something that's today available in the market, but really needs to now go out and tell the story, sell the story eff effectively. So I look at it in terms of three axes of where you need to really help uh, such a company out from, and that's what Invest India tries to do. Um, first is, the user or the customer who can make use of this technology? Do you have, how do you connect with that user base? Uh, and that's the place where by working closely with government, Invest India being a part government, part private enterprise that sits in the middle, uh, working with the various forces in terms of what are some of those innovations that they're looking for? In, you know, if you take the larger systems that are being procured in any country, you know, when I take India as an example, they would be systems that are procured from very large defense contractors and very large systems. But when you come to new technology and innovation, it, it typically happens in terms of at a subsystem level, et cetera. So, so you need to find that way to go prove your technology, do prototypes, do a proof of concept, and first get the um, acceptance of the end user that this technology really works for me. So how do we enable that? So that's where we work closely uh, with both the, 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 the defense ministry and the various organizations and companies under the defense ministry to look at, you know, you know get, give access to companies to some of their problem statements, some of their uh, events that are happening where they explained to the uh, MSME and startup ecosystem in terms of what are some of the problems that they're trying to solve, uh, whether it be in electronics or in sensors or in, in, in technologies that are, are related to radars uh, and uh, you know, countermeasures, all of these. The second is once you have a customer, once you have somebody who's really looking for that, you look at what is the ecosystem that you require in country if you're building that solution because again you can't be doing all parts of the solution you know your sweet sauce or your secret sauce is is what you're working on but you still need the say if you're working on the electronics of it you need still need the mechanicals around it you need the cables the connectors uh, you know the batteries etc around it now for a startup uh, i or for us for a new company in the field it's very important to focus on their core while a lot of things around it are made available to them through an ecosystem. So that's the second part where we connect, where we say that, okay, if you are bringing in say X part of the solution, where can you find in your local ecosystem, the rest of the parts that will make this into a system that's demonstrable, uh, right? Because, you know, and that's something that's very important for early stage companies to know who are the complementary companies and complementary technologies that can come together to, to show something that's demonstrable. And once you have these two, at least in, in paper form, in terms of knowing, uh, you are then starting to look at how do, you, how do you get the money. And that's the place where the third pillar comes in about the outreach to investors, where the government has made various schemes. So, so Invest India is also the nodal agency for India's startup program called Startup India under which there are seed funds available, there are there is mentorship available, and uh, there are uh, common facilities available where you can you know, take some things into test and so on and so forth. So through these three levers is where I, I see um, Invest India making uh, these. One is the access to the end, uh, end user, 
understanding of what some of those challenges are, problem statements are, access to the ecosystem, which will help you build a solution, not by yourself, but with an ecosystem around you, and then access to initial funding through Startup India kind of mechanisms, and then the outreach and the, uh, you know, the connect that we can enable to other VC firms and other angels, you know, like some of uh, them represented here on the panel today. So these three is what I would say, uh, how we come in and enable these kind of companies. And that role as an enabler is is so important because these companies are focused on preserving resources, finding ways to to survive really in sometimes difficult economic situations. And so instead of knocking on hundreds of doors to have a resource like that is is so important, I think, um, for the health of the ecosystem. Uh, Jaseet, I wanted to to turn to you to talk a little bit about this idea of foreign direct investment. And if you could explain that to our participants today, and specifically any encouraging trends you're seeing regarding Indian investment in the US. Sure. Uh, thanks, Lauren. So uh, FDI is a foreign direct investment. And frankly, that's what uh, Select USA is focused on. That's what our mission is, is bringing that foreign direct investment to the United States to create uh, U.S. jobs. So, um, you know, there are some really uh, impressive and I think encouraging trends regarding Indian investment, particularly into the United States. I think one great indication of interest from Indian investors into the United States is the large number of delegates that joined our most recent Select USA Investment Summit. As I mentioned, our Select USA Investment Summit is our once in a year, our annual program, which is sort of our red carpet event uh, for foreign direct investment. Uh, and it is being the most prominent event, we have different delegation, different size delegations come from various countries. And at, I'm proud to say at the 2023 Select USA Investment Summit, which took place in May, it hosted the largest Indian biz business delegation to an investment sum summit ever. Uh, and it was second only by just a handful of delegates to Taiwan's delegation as the record of the largest delegation ever in the history of the summit. So it was, you know, uh, over 200 uh, de uh, delegates came from India uh, to the U.S. for that. So we're we're continuing to see this increasing number of Indian clients and in general increased interest um, among Indian companies. A few kind of uh, key facts I'll relay. The Indian investment in the U.S. Uh, so according to the latest data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the total stock of FDI from India into the United States was $15.5 billion at the end of 2022, and it is the third fastest growing source of FDI into the United States. Um, just as an anecdote, when I was working at the U.S. India Business Council, I was initially um, taking U.S. companies to navigate the Indian uh, landscape and make investments, and pretty quickly, my job converted to taking Indian companies to navigate the U.S. side. Uh, so just anecdotally, an Indian FDI has supported approximately 72,000 U.S. jobs, $280 million in research and development spending, and $1.9 billion worth of goods and exported in 2021 alone. This is particularly challenging, challenging if you think about it, given uh, all that we faced uh, you know, as a world in, in 2021. So it's not surprising then that the U.S. is home to more FDI <clears throat> than any other country in the world and consistently ranks as the number one preferred destination for uh, foreign direct investment for various reasons, right? We have the largest consumer market in the world, uh, a culture of innovation, abundant natural resources, deep uh, capital markets, and, and of course, top-notch universities. Additionally, I mean, this time more than ever, with the Biden administration implementing policies and, and laws such as the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, uh, they're very attractive for both domestic and foreign companies. These laws really, they lay the foundation uh, for the United States to lead on rapid technological innovation that the world needs to transition from clean energy, uh, make the transition to clean energy. And we at Select USA are seeing an increase in interest from Indian companies to come to the U.S. And we're we're here at Select USA to help uh, with this support. So for all the businesses that are listening today, I want to make sure 
that you register for the 2024 Select USA Investment Summit, which will take place from June 23rd to the 26th, 2024. So June 23rd to the 26th, it's at National Harbor, Maryland, just about 25 minutes outside of Washington, DC. My team will be happy uh, that I made this plug for Select USA Investment Summit. And I just got uh, you know a note before this meeting that we're proud to be able to say that Ambassador Garcetti will be leading the Indian delegation. What we know will be another impressive and, and very large and vibrant delegation from India. That's very helpful back to just where does one start? And I think by showing up at that conference is a great way to build the network, meet people, understand how to navigate resources. So um, sounds like a really great opportunity um, that goes beyond just the U.S.-India relationship as well, just focused on the international stage and navigating opportunities. Um, so with the international focus in mind, Avinash, I wanted to go back to you to talk a little bit more more about now are you primarily investing in Indian companies or are you looking at international opportunities as well and how do you approach those perfect so we do have a India focus uh, so approximately about 70 to 80 percent of our investments are in Indian domiciled companies uh, we do invest 20 percent of our uh, funds outside of India in companies domiciled outside of India uh, but one of our mandates as from uh, when we raised our fund as well is that even if the company is domiciled outside of India, there is some Indian connect to it. Either there's an Indian founder, you have a development center in India and so on and so forth. All right. So that is a major factor uh, when we are making our investment decisions. Now, having said that, uh, our companies do have clients across the world. Uh, right. So even if you are domiciled in India, some of our companies have only customers based on the US or the Europe. Uh, right. Uh, so that is there, but that is that becomes a much uh, that becomes a little bit harder for say defense applications as well, or even deep tech applications, because um, uh, some of our companies have found it difficult to say sell to the U.S. government, for example, right? Uh, just because there is a lot of uh, uh, process procedure and rightfully so that you have to go through, and most Indian companies don't have that, right? So so that is something where uh, we are also actively working with uh, say some co investors in the U.S. as well and probably with some people in the panel here as well, on how we could navigate that uh, to cross that bridge, right? Because we do believe that um, our defense uh, or companies are coming up with applications, with products, which are in line with global standards. Uh, but getting that GTM right uh, is, is proving to be tricky. Let's talk about that a little bit. What do you see as the greatest hurdle or challenge for um, Indian companies to do business in the U.S.? And do you have any examples of a successful model to follow? And Avinash, maybe I can just have you answer that. And if others have thoughts to chime in. Sure. So um, there has been precedence in other sectors, uh, primarily software, uh, right? So uh, uh, IT services started out back in the 2000s and early, early 2000s, uh, uh, where they sold to um, customers in the US by having outbound sales teams where people on the ground uh, went and sold software, right? Uh, then after the SaaS revolution came about, uh, there was more uh, inclination towards buying software uh, over a phone uh, or just by swiping a credit card and buying it without having, having to ever meet a person, right? So there has been precedence in software, but in hardware, deep tech and other applications, companies are still finding it really hard, primarily because um, in software, it's easier to get the customer, the end buyer, uh, to figure out or, or see how good the solution is, uh, right, fairly easily. But in hardware, deep tech and others, right, you have to go to them, or rather, sometimes even the product is not there available in the US, you have to come to uh, another site and probably in Singapore and New Zealand or wherever it is, for them to show uh, proof of success, right. Uh, so that buying cycle becomes very, very um, long in some sense, right? Uh, so in hardware, uh, we are not seeing major successes. Uh, there have been a few companies who have tried to figure it out, uh, but uh, that is something for which Indian companies are still struggling with um, uh, right now. Uh, however, they've tried to solve for it. Uh, they've tried to domicile themselves in the US, uh, right? Having some development centers in the US, even though it becomes a bit more costlier and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, there are few have found success there. Siddharth, does Invest India look at this as an enabler as well? Do you help companies navigate business in the U.S. or international business? 
not not that much as of now, but in the enhanced bandit that we have starting this year, we are starting to look at exports and you know the trade aspects of it as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the past, our uh, mandate has been largely to seek inbound investment into the into these areas, both uh, into existing companies, large projects, startups, everything. Uh, but um, helping companies go out and find external markets, that's something that we are just about as invest in the just starting this year. Uh, hmm. So these would be issues that are very important in terms of uh, looking at what some of these barriers are. In many cases, you know, some of these are not kind of trade barriers, but there's, there's some kind of non-trade barriers, some certifications, some requirements that are very specific to a sector. And in many cases, companies coming from a geography like India are not even aware of the requirements that they have to comply to. And that's one area which we have identified where maybe a lot more work needs to be done in terms of how do we help them reach that. And the reason why we need to be really focused on this is because uh, a lot of this technology development uh, requires multiple customers that they can finally sell to. Uh, while proof of concept, proving uh, a technology uh, can be done at a proto stage at a, a different kind of cost point, if you really have to manufacture at cost and compete in this market, you need an access to a larger larger market. So that's something that we'll be focusing on starting this year. But as of now, I do not have many stories to say in terms of how that, uh, you know, that route of uh, reverse uh, uh, cases have worked out. So hopefully next time we speak, I have more. Well, it's exciting that you're prioritizing it as a growth area. Um, and I think also, of course, an exciting aspect of the Indus X partnership too, um, where we can really find ways to expand that cross-pollination. Um, Andy, I wanted to pivot to you to talk about how you are scoping any international investments. Are you looking at India as a market where you'd like to invest? And then maybe we can pivot to um, talk about how your portfolio companies look at India as a market to enter. So two things from an investment and then sure, market. yeah, maybe I could uh, just for the for the founders on the call too. I wanted to, and maybe now isn't when you want to to focus on it, but there are some sort of unique requirements to doing business with the Department of Defense that they should at least be sort of initially aware of, especially at the earliest stages of their company as they're kind of plotting the growth structure, right? I mean, I could jump into those now or we could we could sort of get, get to it later, but- um, Let's do it. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So, you know, generally speaking, if we thinking for thinking about, let's start with capitalization of uh, your early stage company that is based in India and intends to, or has aspirations to do business with the Department of Defense. It is really important for, for not only the DOD, but for firms like ours who may be prospective future investors of yours to um, have transparency into who the beneficial owners of those companies are. And I, I don't want to kind of go down the rabbit hole on adversarial capital and and why we what we're specifically concerned about, but that idea of making sure that you know in fact who the end beneficial owners are of the entities investing in your firm are. Um, it should also kind of it, it'll also have so it'll have maybe an impact on your capitalization strategy in the short term, but it can also have uh, an impact on you know, maybe even small scale inorganic growth, right? If you're doing a stock and cash transaction with a company that you're folding to yours, you have to understand who are you issuing that stock to, right? And it will also fuel who are you giving board seats to, right? Which feeds into this idea of if you're going to do business with DOD, you should at least have, or aspire to do business with DOD, you should at least have a, a general understanding of the structural requirements to do so, right? Um, you know, DOD thinks about FOCI, which is uh, for foreign ownership controller influence, and how do we kind of mitigate those things as as someone is on a contract pathway to doing business with DOD? Um, you know, there are things like special security agreements, security control agreements. Proxy agreements for subsidiaries, you know, voting trust agreements for subsidiaries that are based in the U.S. and um, 
the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, which is DCSA.mil, has a really concise explanation of these things. I'm not suggesting that early stage founders spend a ton of time on this, but you should at least understand it if this is part of your eventual go-to-market map, because these should inform your decisions earlier on so that you don't kind of make a decision that will preclude you from perhaps doing business in the future with, with DOD. Um, so sort of all I'll say on that topic, Lauren, if you want to remind me of, of what the, the primary question was, I'm happy to address it too. And I'll just foot stomp your point, Andy, because I focus on the national security markets. Um, I'll give it a specific example. I've seen a um, a gaming company that was aspiring to do business with the Department of Defense, but started a joint venture in China that prohibited them from doing so. So I think, as Andy said, take a look at if you're you're seeking work with the U.S. government, um, if you are taking um, capital from or um, looking at ownership structures that involve our adversaries, it'll prohibit you from, from doing this business. So just go in with eyes wide open um, in that sense. And Andy, my question was around um, doing your, your strategy for international investments. Are you looking at companies in India um, as opportunities? And maybe we can come back to it after, but I was going to actually have you flip the question of your portfolio companies doing business in India as well. Um, and so I know there's a lot there. So maybe start with sure. just the investment side. Yeah, I mean, we are expanding. The majority of our investments now are US-based investments. We're expanding the aperture of that. We have three portfolio companies in Canada, one based in Germany. Um, we're evaluating other opportunities. Uh, we would certainly consider an investment in, a, in an Indian company. I think for us, we would want to the ideal point for that and really where, where I think we could add value is as when they're tipping over to that point where they want to do business in the United States. How can we help them with, you know, their go to market with respect to the United States government? How can we help advise them on the issues that I just described? But also if they're planning on standing up a US, US subsidiary for compliance purposes or otherwise, we can help them with, you know, sort of identifying the folks that can act as their directors here in the States and can add value that way. Um, to the second point of the question, I mean, yes, our companies are acutely interested in doing business in India. Um, actually, as it happens this week, we have uh, a company on the ground in New Delhi that is doing a pilot program as a subcontractor uh, for a safe cities uh, contract for uh, gunshot detection. Um, we're also investors in Voyager Space which recently signed an MOU um, for uh, for the, the proposed crewed, sp crewed spacecraft to service their Starlab commercial space station. Uh, and then coincidentally, I had a call yesterday uh, with a company that we recently committed to that is uh, producing radioisotope power sources uh, that's meeting with the space ambassador in India for a second or third time. And by the way, they've had, they gave really good feedback on that relationship dynamic. Um, so the answer to your, to your question is yes, of course, our companies are very interested in doing business in and with India um, in terms of our investments. You know, I think for us, again, the logical entry point is as they're tipping over into doing more business with, with the United States. And I think we would look at co-investors like Avinash as our businesses are starting to do more businesses in India, this is a great example of a partnership that work where they can add add value, uh, you know, on the other side in helping us to navigate the complexities there. That's very helpful. And on this idea of partnerships, it's again something I always find interesting to navigate because there are aspects of it that are critical to being able to enter a market or successfully sell into, say. The Department of Defense or the MOD. Um, and Siddharth, you talked about this as well, this idea of teaming. And Andy, you just mentioned one of your portfolio companies is a sub to a prime. Um, I'm curious if any of you on the line have um, advice about how to team uh, with other companies. Is, is it traditional primes? Is it international companies? And how to think about teaming also from a technical perspective to 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 
finalize your solution, not just sell one part of a technology, but to really figure out how to come up with a team that has a, a viable solution as well. So how, how do you advise companies when it comes to teaming with other companies? So I would say two things. One is uh, look at the complementarities that you're bringing in. And again, when you're, when you're looking at something like you, I think some of the complementarities are, are, are very evident in terms of, if you look at really uh, the infusion of technology uh, in this area of defense, you know, US is the natural leader in terms of where technology uh, development has happened in the defense sector for a long time because of, of its indigenous capabilities and cutting edge capabilities it's had for decades. The defense sector has been reliant on imports. So homegrown tech development in India has, has lagged in this sector to a certain extent. While India has made some rapid advancements, for example, in space, where you know, India's successful moon mission and uh, mission to Mars, et cetera, have put India uh, on, on that pedestal with respect to some technologies. In the larger defense context, I would say uh, access to technology has been something that's been lacking in India. So technology partnerships with both startups and larger companies in India is what Indian companies look forward to uh, greatly. And in return, what's available in India is the large market of defense spending that India is opening itself up to. And India's defense spend, which traditionally have been with many other countries now in the recent few years, a lot more of that is shifting towards the US and, and towards the Western world. So there is opportunity that's been created. But what India is trying to do is to use these partnerships to make sure that India does not remain just an importer of technology, but is able to indigenize that over time. And if not indigenize quickly, at least start with local manufacturing or local support of these, of, of the products and of the technologies. So what I would advise is that the technology component of what India is getting or what the Indian partner is getting in terms of technology access would be something that when the government of India evaluates a proposal for such a partnership and looks at what sort of incentives to give to that partnership in terms of being able to set up a factory or set up operations, uh, et cetera, the technology aspect of it would be, would be number one. The second aspect then would be by doing that technology uh, transfer to India, can you address a larger market? Because the inherent advantages of India is going to be its lower cost and its ability to scale up uh, production at lower cost. So if those cost advantages of India can be utilized and this can be fed back into the global ecosystem. So when you, so when you form partnerships uh, in India, I think the, the way to look forward is it's not India for India alone, but it's India for the world. And how can you supplement Indian engineering with technology uh, from the US, set up a base for addressing maybe an immediate Indian requirement, but then look at the scale that it can give back to the global business that the same company or, or uh, you know, startup is looking at. So that's how I would put it. Technology has to be on the forefront. Ability to scale and cost would be what the Indian companies would bring to the table. That's great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to pivot to something, again, focused on entrepreneurs. I, I understand that Select USA has a program that's dedicated to addressing specific challenges for global female entrepreneurs. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit just about that program um, for our listeners. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, that's correct. We do have a program that is specifically geared towards supporting women tech entrepreneurs. It's called the Select Global Women in Tech or SQUIT uh, Mentorship Network. And this is a year-long program that introduces international tech entrepreneurs to the U.S. market with support of Select USA's traditional data and counseling services, but with the addition of community learning and networking opportunities. So the SQUIT program formally launches at the Select USA Investment Summit, and it offers participants access to a, a number of areas. It, you'll get an experienced mentor from the US startup ecosystem as an informational resource on challenges that might be related to scaling, promoting, fundraising, and establishing your business in the United States. 
Also, you get access to an exclusive networking platform to connect with the SQUIT community. Uh, also, Select USA Data and Counseling Services, as I mentioned earlier. You get access to educational content, webinars, workshops, virtual events, networking opportunities, including but not limited to the annual Select USA Investment Summit. And uh, last point I want to make is just how uh, how popular and and how um, how well received this program has been. Uh, our inception was in 2021, and since then the Squit Mentorship Network has grown over 200 percent. So uh, we're just incredibly proud of uh, this program uh, and all those that are involved in it. That's awesome! What a great resource. Um, Avinash, I wanted to pivot. We talked a little bit about a thoughtful approach to um, secure cap tables. I, I wanted to see if you and maybe Andy had any advice as we think about um, security of things like IP um, and really cybersecurity. How should entrepreneurs from an early um, start think about securing their intellectual property? Um, do you give any advice to your portfolio companies on that front? Um, yeah, so so two ways we think about it. One is it has to come grounds up from day one, right? So you can't be, say, 24 months into the journey of your company or 36 months into the journey and then try and change the DNA of the company to make sure that, you know, you are looking after cybersecurity or even protecting intellectual property, right? Uh, protecting IP starts from day zero or even day minus five, uh, right? Um, of course, patents and so on are the way to go about it. But one of the things we also tell our portfolio companies is, is if it can be easy to replicate it, even with a patent, right? Uh, eventually, you're going to get competed away, uh, right? So that so building that competitive advantage, that moat, uh, you got to have introspect to your uh, to yourself to say, hey, is the tech which I'm really building, um, is it really differentiated, or is it just like something in a different uh, flavor or in a different costume, uh, right? Uh, so of course, we tell them to patent and patent as much as possible and so on and so forth. But we will also realize that at scale, uh, right, you will have competitors from across the world uh, and very smart ones uh, copy every last inch of that and uh, pursuing litigation and so on and so forth does become quite hard, uh, right? Uh, cybersecurity uh, for internal purposes, right, uh, is also something which they have to start from day one. Uh, it becomes really hard after a certain point in time to inculcate that into the DNA of the company, right? Uh, so even though it's an extra added cost uh, um, uh, towards the start of the company or towards the, when, when you, you know, at the early stages of the company, it does pay off dividends later on, right? So short-term pain for long-term gain in some sense there. Uh, that's how we think about it. Uh, but uh, also IP also, uh, when we do, uh, our companies are trying to figure out IP, uh, even though patents are there, We've seen that they do get copied and pursuing litigation becomes very, very difficult after a certain point in time. I, I, I'd add just two other things for SaaS, for software companies, thinking about your who is touching your code base and what, like what, who has access to what and when, right? And that also feeds in later to kind of a supply chain integrity question if you're trying to do business in the USA. Um, uh, Hardware folks, you know, what is the, what are the various components of your supply chain? And, and again, who, who is seeing what parts of your plan, your your plans and your schema? Is there an opportunity for, let's say, replication somewhere along the way? Um, and then lastly, you should also think about your vendors, right? And I'm sure Avinash would agree when you're thinking about cybersecurity more broadly, some folks overlook the idea that different vendors within your sort of component stack in operating your company have access to very sensitive information. So understand who those people are, you know, how they can interface with your information and what sort of privacy protections there are for you to make sure that your intellectual property isn't inadvertently being leaked through those through those vendors. That's great advice. I want to you brought up Andy um, supply chain security. I wanted to see if any others on the line had advice or thoughts about navigating supply chain um, security or supply chain related issues. So Thanks. not specifically on supply chain security, but you know, coming from a supply chain evaluation perspective, I think 
uh, it's very important for smaller companies to, to realize what some of the expectations from supply chain are uh, when you try to become part of a global value chain. And I think something that I've personally seen is the fact that one, uh, the focus has to be a lot more on process and process compliance because you're looking for repeatable high quality results when it comes to onboarding a vendor for long-term use in an industry like defense. Not, you know, I come from a semiconductor background primarily, but, uh, but the, the general principles are very, very similar in terms of you need to be looking at supply chain from multiple aspects of cost, quality, availability, technology, scalability, sustainability. There are a number of different requirements that are needed to be focused on. And some of these requirements, when you are at a stage, when you are a startup, when you are a smaller organization, um, you know, don't get that much of focus. But then when you need to expand quickly and you need to serve a global market, it becomes that much more important to make sure that you have systems in place, you have uh, processes in place, you have ways of evaluating your own suppliers downstream. You have methods of looking at your incoming quality. You have methods of, of creating the documentation and traceability of your process that is needed in order to comply to various uh, requirements. So uh, I think understanding the requirements from a supply chain, understanding the requirements from the, you know, the, the aspect of not just quality, but other process attributes of material management, of how you need to be to be managing your equipment, what sort of safety guidelines you need to fo follow for your employees, even factory safety, things like these. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, smaller companies get caught on the wrong foot when you have a delegation coming in and trying to evaluate you uh, for a for a supply chain evaluation. So some form of uh, kind of regular in in-house audits of all your processes. So that when the time comes, when you have a, a, a good enough or a good client coming to, to do a check uh, for you, you should already be prepared. So tying up with uh, some agencies, doing your regular audits ahead of time and not waiting for that at the time when that opportunity is knocking on your door and then you're trying to change your processes and make those improvements uh, will will you know not be sufficient. So from a supply chain perspective, I think you have to build in quality and you have to build in process right from the start and keep improving it. You know, of course, some of this comes at a cost, but unless you have that focus right from the beginning, I think it'll be very difficult to catch up towards something of these at the end. That's great advice. And I think gets back to something you you started off with, which is the idea of scale. Um, and and to have this at, at the top of mind in the beginning, I think is important to enable eventual scalability too. So th thank you for that. Um, Jesse, I wanted to get back to something um, we've, we've talked about just in terms of uh, the perspective from a, an early entrepreneur and fundraiser. If they can't make it to the June conference, what's, what's the next best way to engage the Select USA team or to reach out? Is there an email address or what are some other ways to get involved? Yeah, great, great question. Um, maybe I'll pop it into the, the chat. We have someone who leads our Select USA tech program. Um, and uh, uh, I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. But aside from the, the summit, we do events, you know, around the year in different markets that are oftentimes uh, a really valuable uh, place for investors at every stage uh, of their development to connect with Select USA. Uh, for example, just yesterday I was in Brazil and we have a really popular road show where we had brought about 12 states with us there. Uh, we've done the same thing in uh, Italy. We've done uh, it in different countries. Um, for Indian investors, though, in particular, I think at, at this point, the Select USA Summit is sort of the, the one-stop shop, can't do anything better than that. But if you're, if you're not at the point that, uh, and I should say that, that the Select USA Summit is whether you are just starting out in your journey and you want to just have an early connect, pick up some cards, that summit is for those investors as well as those who are right on the finish line and you know even are uh, interested in making an announcement that's going to get sort of uh, federal attention. Um, so I think uh, bar none, the Select USA Summit is is the best place. But I'll be happy to throw into the chat a uh, an email address that uh, 
anyone in your audience might might uh, contact for further information. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and for all panelists, but maybe while I have you, Jesse, I'll start with you. I know I avoided asking about specific technology areas of interest uh, at the yeah. top. They wanted to talk about more of the process side, um, sure. but I was thinking I could go around the horn now and talk about um, technology or kind of critical industry focus yeah. areas. So does yeah. USA have any? Definitely. And I, I mentioned at the outset some of the legislation that the U.S. government has uh put out, you know, some, uh, we think of this as a once in a generation kind of investment in uh, these critical technologies. Uh, I would definitely highlight the semiconductor uh, uh, sector. I would highlight green technologies generally, but uh, in particular advanced batteries um, and critical minerals, um, biotech and pharmaceuticals uh, have also been kind of uh, getting a lot of attention. And I think I would, uh, say that these are the the top ones that the US currently is is focused on. Thank you. Avinash, do you have any specific tech focus areas for the fund? Uh, uh, so in deep tech particularly, uh, so we're looking at uh, space tech for sure. Uh, so satellites and rockets is something which we're actively looking at. Uh, we're also looking at robotics. Um, and we are also looking at construction technology, uh, just because there's been a push from the government right now. Uh, there's been a huge kind of investment in capex in building out infrastructure. So those are some tailwinds for India per se. From a global perspective, um, semiconductors is definitely one focus area for us as well. Uh, so those are the four main things we're looking at. But uh, anything with a deep IP play and something which is coming about from the US and something we're learning as well, a lot of investment has gone in, is uh, getting energy from nuclear fission and fusion. Uh, I'm not sure how viable that's going to be. Uh, but every now, every day I, I hear about some company or the other raising 20, 30 million just to prove out nuclear fusion. Uh, so that's also something we're looking at on whether that, that is even uh, possible uh, right now. How exciting. Uh, Andy, how about from your firm's perspective? Sorry, I had to unmute there. Um, look, I, at the top, I sort of mentioned what our six focus areas are, but let me maybe think in the context of, of the Indusex platform and, and some of the overlap between what we're doing and, and their focus areas. I think, um, you know, they're focused, uh, the, the th three overlap areas for us would be ISR, right? And kind of the marrying of those ISR, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance technologies with different areas of domain awareness to include undersea, um, I think unmanned systems is an area where we're heavily investing in various aspects along the 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 chain of of unmanned systems platforms, space technology, um, to be sure, right? I mean, we have a number of active investments. I think those are three areas in particular where there's areas where we're excited about collaboration between. Kind of the U.S. and India, our companies and uh, potential Indian customers, and vice versa. Um, sort of pointing at two things that I think are pushing pushing those along. Um, the two challenges that uh, Indusex did recently: uh, there was the maritime ISR challenge, and then an underwater comms challenge too. Um, just to sort of show that in in action. But those are areas where we see really good opportunities for collaboration between. Um, uh, the U.S. and India and our firm and and Indian companies. Um, I would also add one more thing is kind of infrastructure protection as it overlays all of those things. Um, so yeah, those the, those would be the areas I would call out. Awesome, Siddharth. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add one area, which is the area of drones. I think drones represent a large opportunity both in civilian and defense space because. It's, it's something that, uh, you know, cuts across both. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunity in civilian uh, usage of drones as well in terms of use cases that are, are being developed. And from an India perspective, there is a lot of focus uh, specifically on drones as a technology area. So that's one area that I'm seeing a lot of startups starting to focus on and a uh, lot of uh, interest from India with uh, respect to that area. Thank you. 
I'm going to start taking questions from the audience. We have a few that have already came in here that I'll um, go start going through. And if others have them, please, please start sending questions our way. Um, one I want to start with is directed at Avinash. Um, what metrics are used for IP valuation of a hardware startup? Oh, okay. Um, it's going to be more subjective than objective here. Mm -hmm. uh, but the main thing we're looking at is, uh, first is your end goal vision, uh, right? Or even the first two, three iterations of the product. Are you looking at something which is exponential uh, to what the incumbent has in terms of the current solution, uh, right? So that's going to be the main kind of evaluation metric for us. And the second one is what is your process and uh, how are you looking at getting there with the capital which you're planning to raise or you already have, all right? Because we've seen when you do that stretch, right? Uh, there's enough kind of uh, places where uh, points of failure. And if you don't uh, uh, allocate sufficient bu buffer of capital, it becomes really hard. So your thought process around how are you even getting to that end state, right? So those are the two main kind of things we're looking at uh, when you're evaluating a hardware startup uh, for the IP uh, in some sense, right? Commercialization, GTM, and so on are are uh, things which are later um, in, in uh, later down. Uh, but just to start with, is your solution, uh, at, or at least at least how you're looking at the solution, is it exponentially better than what the incumbent is providing? Thank you. Um... I'm navigating a few here. One is interesting just around any networking platforms for defense electronics. So my interpretation of that is we've talked about the conference for Select USA or in-person events. Are, are, any ideas around virtual opportunities to network, um, perhaps think tanks or nonprofit organizations? wonder if the Chamber of Commerce is a, a good one to throw out there um, to the U.S. India Business Council, just seat that you mentioned comes to mind for me. But Andy, were you going to jump in? I was just going to point out this this sounds like a, like a great opportunity for, for Ensign to uh, put together a virtual uh, you know, networking opportunity between the U.S. and India on this topic, but not, not to create work for you guys. But I think that's a great one. And um, it sounds like we'll be building out more programming. Um, so for the Ensign folks to follow up with, great idea, Andy. Uh, I'm going to jump to a question here. Let's see. And I see Ensign has waved in to say great, or, or um, jumped in to say great idea. So it's exciting. So Siddharth, this is for you. What's the scope of an early stage startup working in the technology sector and has IP to access the market in terms of getting contracts for developing? Let's see. So maybe I'll, I'll um, use my interpretation of that. Anything else on compliance to be able to go after contracts? With IP, I know on the U.S. side we have to navigate things like CMMC, which is a certification process to show cybersecurity needs are met on the contractor side. Um, but Siddharth, any thoughts there? Yeah, so some of the things that we're doing in India is there are some relaxations uh, that are given for startups in terms of when government is procuring or the forces are procuring. Typically, uh, while buying from large companies, there is prior experience uh, requirements. There are prior turnover requirements. That's there are earnest money deposits that are needed, uh, which are all by the general financial rules. There are a lot of constraints that are put uh, on who can sell uh, to the government and sell to the forces. Uh, now, for startups, there are certain relaxations available. And you know, companies that are reaching out in terms of wanting to supply technology to the government and to the forces. And if they are registered startups under the Startup India program, and they have been recognized as startups working on technologies that are of interest, they get some of these relaxations in, in conditions. The second is that in India, there is a, a, a government marketplace where you can register these, these products 
uh, and the the government and the defense uh, community can also access uh, the government e marketplace as it is called and the startups can get registered with the e marketplace and and provide their uh, products and solutions through that marketplace to to government buyers um, there's also other procurement portals that the government runs um, and uh, these are access uh, accessible to startups to go register themselves uh, on those portals and then go through those processes and to help them through that process they can always uh, you know take the help of of startup india program reach out to uh, you know the startup mentors and advisors on how they can use some of these portals and some of these mechanisms available to make themselves visible to the end end buyer uh, so these are some means that uh, there are uh, for making sure that you're visible and the rest of it is in terms of like you mentioned earlier there are events that are conducted by both industry associations by startup india program by uh, organizations like idex itself where um, you bring the buyer seller meet kind of uh, philosophy where you can bring your technology there get yourself heard so i don't think there is one single method of really going and getting uh, those connects and those relationships to make your technology ip or product uh, visible to the end user you will have to have a combination of these strategies to to get to uh, where you want to Thank you, Siddharth. You, you answered a theme that I'm seeing in many questions here around creating awareness of technologies, finding opportunities for partnerships and networking. Um, thank you for that. We've got a question here about ITAR, um, which I know is a very tricky uh, process to navigate, but uh, to see if any panelists have thoughts on how are ITAR issues resolved with respect to U.S. companies wanting to license AI for space tech to Indian customers. Uh, Andy, any advice around I, I, was, I, I That's sort of a very, very narrow use case. So AI <laughs> for, um, look, I, I guess the, the, the understanding ITAR, it, it's sort of more complex. The, the, there's a bunch of different levels, right? When you think about kind of, you know, how does it apply to software and, you know, technical specifications and like really understanding when the disclosure event occurs and where, um, I, there's not like a, a, this is, this is not a question where you should listen to anyone's advice other than an, an attorney on this, because this is a, a sensitive topic and you do not want to have a fault here on you know, in, in particular on sort of the technical specification disclosure event that can even occur, can consider, be considered to have occurred uh, in a in a simple conversation that occurs in the United States with a representative of a foreign entity. So I, I, I unfortunately, I can't give you like a, an easy answer to this other than to give you the advice that make sure that you are comfortable with uh, with council's approval of when and how these types of disclosures occur. So, sorry, I don't have a, an easy answer or, or free answer for you there. It's uh, a good uh, talk to a lawyer is what I'm hearing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I want to flip um, to talk about incentives, um, particularly, and Siddharth, thank you for commenting about the FDI um, incentives. But Jesse, any comments about um, how you're looking to attract foreign investment, specifically around incentives that investors can pursue um, looking to the U.S.? Yeah, uh, great question, Lauren. And, you know, um, many, most of the incentives, as you know, historically definitely have been at the state level. So when an investor has tried to navigate the U.S. system, they would go to various states. And one of the first conversations, aside from um, you know, the regulatory environment, of course, and, and site selection potentially would be around what are the incentives that a state is is giving uh, uh, to kind of um, encourage uh, investment into uh, said state. Um, really, for, for the first time, uh, the U.S. at the federal level has these very large incentive packages, as I mentioned, related to semiconductors with the Chips and Science Act. Um, 
or the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, invests $369 billion into uh, clean energy uh, and green tech solutions. So uh, it's really kind of the first time that in our history that investors have a really good reason to stop by, I would say, the federal government on their way to the states to um, kind of make sure that they are, and, and these can be stacked, I should be clear. It's not that if you get a state incentive that you can't get the federal incentive, or if you get the federal incentive, you can't get the state one. Certainly they can be stacked, but they do have to comply with all the you know uh, rules and, and regulations. And there are uh, quite a few. Now, these are <laughs> relatively new, um, you know, just within the last, you know, uh, sometimes uh, 12, 18, 24 months that these incentives have been announced, passed as laws in the United States. So that process certainly takes time. And, and we do appreciate, of course, the patience that uh, investor, the investor community has had with regards to kind of finding out what are the explicit rules around these. Um, but, um, of course, Select USA is here to navigate both sides of that, that equation. Whether you're coming and you have questions on the regulatory side or you have questions on the incentive side, Select USA may not be the uh, subject matter expert on said topic, but we are in, we are happy to put you in touch with the people who can get you an answer. I view very much our job to just, uh, sometimes a quick no is very valuable in this business. And we wanna make sure you're not waiting around um, and you can adjust your strategy as necessary or hopefully pursue whatever path you're you're intending with with uh support of the u.s government that's a great point it, it instead of wasting cycles trying to find an answer even if the answer is no it's so helpful to hear that sooner rather than later um, and i see that happen all too often um i've, I've got another question here uh, it's a specific technology question around counter uas um particularly low altitude airspace management um it, for, for our investors, Andy, Siddharth, is this an area you're looking at from an investment perspective, counter UAS? Uh, yes. I, I mean, when we think about un, unmanned broadly, it's, you know, UAS and CUAS, right? So um, whether that's, uh, you know, one of our companies is pursuing kind of the challenge of airspace management under 400 feet, right? Um but that is identification and tracking, not necessarily mitigation. Um, but look, as the as unmanned broadly, you know, continues to expand in adoption, this becomes more important that the CUAS technologies or counter CUAX, right? Uh, the counter all unmanned system technologies are keeping up. I mean, from a United States perspective, we saw a fairly dramatic failure in the last seven days. Um, so yes, this is a, a space that we're focused on to be sure. Avanash? Oh, so that you want to go first or? No, no, go ahead. I didn't catch the original question fully. It'd sure. be great to hear Kalari's perspective. Thank you, Avanash, too, on CUAS investments. Sure. So the only thing here on CUAS and even unmanned traffic management, right? The use, the commercial use cases. Um, uh, or rather the other use cases apart from just uh, government and defense in India per se, we've seen it to be um, quite on the lower side than what we typically would like to be, uh, right? Uh, so even though there is some interest, you've got to show the path to a venture outcome here, uh, right? So um, here I, I would much rather put it in terms of, you know, do you have uh, enough kind of market demand uh, from an India perspective or do you know how to sell outside of India for this? And that would be the main kind of uh, point for us on whether we're taking it forward or not, right? But primarily because uh, these are very, very small um, subsec subsectors within drones, uh, right? Even though drones uh, has uh, given us good outcomes, uh, two, three companies have gone public, gone public as well in the last year or so. Um, there has not been kind of, for these specific kind of use cases, uh, large outcomes is what we've seen. Thank you. Um, I have one more question here that I'll address before we go around uh, to each panelist to see if any final thoughts and advice for entrepreneurs or others on the line. But before I do that, 
We have um, a question here around license, licensing systems in India. Um, Siddharth, does Invest India have any resources for startups wanting to get into ammunition, explosives, motor manufacturing, um, in terms of obtaining licenses and permission for, for such things? And Avinash, I don't know if you have advice about just how to approach the process there too, but Siddharth. Any quick yeah, thoughts so, there? So we have both investment advisors and facilitators available both at Invest India to help you navigate what the rules, licensing, et cetera, for setting up uh, new businesses or ent existing businesses to enter these new areas. Uh, so you can reach, uh, reach out to us uh, through the Invest India facilitators. I'm putting a few links on the chat windows uh, here as well. Um, so Invest India, uh, resources are available. I just put the defense uh, manufacturing uh, link in there. The other resource that you can use is the Startup India website. I'll put that link in here as well, uh, where startup advisors will take you through that process of what you need to do to register as a DPIIT, which is the Department of Internal Trade uh, and Promotion website, uh, how to be recognized as a startup in India, and then what advantages it gives you in terms of access to both the ecosystem investors and the seed funds. So I'll put those resources on the chat window. You can, you can go through them. There's a lot of uh, material that we've put out there to help in terms of what some of the, uh, the requirements are, how you can make your uh, application, what you need to do. And then the contacts uh, of the investment advisors and the startup advisors are there as well, uh, which you can reach out to and you'll be sure to get a, a response from them uh, you know, within 48 hours, most, most of the time. Thank you. Avinash, any advice on just licensing and permissions or what you tell your, your founders? Um, I mean, honestly, there's no better resource, uh, Lauren, than Invest India for this. Yeah, awesome. They know what they're doing, uh, right? But uh, also here, um, uh, one thing we also advise our founders is, is to start early. You're not going to get your licensing and other kind of permissions in day one. Right, and it is a process and you have to be ready for that process. Thank you. Um, well, we have a few minutes left before I hand it back to Kedar. Um, Jesse, maybe I can start with you. Any closing thoughts for folks on the line? I, I would just say that the, the time is right. Uh, if you're thinking about an investment in the United States, uh, as I mentioned, there's kind of this once in a generation investment. Uh, so the global signal is is out there and Select USA, you know, uh, we're also, you know, humbled uh, by investors who are considering the United States. Of course, there are many benefits as we see, but uh, everyone has choices. And as part of that, we want to make sure that uh, investors know that Select USA is a resource for them along their journey journey, um, uh, both whether you have uh, need support now or at any point in your journey. So we hope to see you at the Select USA Investment Summit, June 23rd to the 26th. Applications are now open. You can go to our website and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Avinash, any closing thoughts? Uh, no, I, I think um, like uh, Mr. Singh said, uh, the time right now is, is uh, uh, ripe, primarily because the Indo-US corridor uh, I've not seen it as bubbling as it is uh, right now in the even in the last like 20 years uh, right so and there's a lot of trust between both the nations and um, right now there's a lot of trade which is happening and it's just growing uh, right uh, so uh, uh, now there's no better time than now to start and the amount of capital available even in India right now right uh, uh, when it started like five years ago there were about say give or take about 50 to 60 VC funds in India right now there are easily about 600 VC funds in India Right? So the availability of capital is just exponentially grown as well. Uh, so all the tailwinds are there. Uh, it's just a matter of getting on the ground and executing. Thank you. Siddharth. No, I think I'll, I'll go back to what uh, Jasit said at the start. You know, this relationship is very strong and now, you know, both ways. You know, he spoke about the 15.5 billion of FDI that India has, has put into the US, the 72,000 jobs created the 1.9 billion of goods exported as a result of that, et cetera. So, you know, what more uh, is, is testament to this strong relationship and the way that, you know, that we are working with each other to help each other's economies, help each other's uh, strategic uh, needs. And as I mentioned, I think there are complementarities. You know, I think the strength that India needs to draw from US is, is technology and the, the what it, uh, offers to US firms and to US companies is the market in India, which is now opening up a lot more 
to technologies from the US and companies uh, from the US in, in the defense space. Uh, so I think the, the future is bright and I think the relationship is strong. What more can we ask than that in order to make these uh, changes that we want to? What an important tone to close on and a tough one to follow. Andy, we'll leave it to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna start with, with uh, uh, let, let me just make a pitch for uh, Select USA. Uh, I was actually recently at a conference in Montreal that they put on. We brought uh, one of our companies that is based in Montreal who, were, who was able to interface with, I think there was 36 different economic development agencies there. That's like, it saves you like three years of work to be in one room with all of those groups simultaneously. So we plan on being at the conference in June. Just let me give a, a, a unsolicited endorsement of, of the upcoming event too. Um, uh, for, from my perspective, um, look, we think that the kind of dual use application space is more investable, more VC investable right now than really any time in history. You know, the focus of the, of the problem sets is sort of more solvable by early stage companies than re you know, really ever before. Um, we're excited to continue to you know, watch this engagement between the United States and India improve, increase in volume. Um, we're excited to partner with folks like Avinash and Siddharth to you know, really watch those technologies move back and forth. So um, I wanna say thank you to, uh, to Lauren and everyone for organizing and all the attendees for for uh, for joining us today too. So. What an important conversation and important relationship. I uh, heard so much about the overlap in terms of technology focus areas. Um, it's a complicated process to navigate, but I'm hearing there are a lot of resources to both companies in India and the US um, and opportunities to build that network too. And um, top of mind, sounds like the Select USA conference in June. So um, thank you to our panelists. We know how busy you are all as leaders in your respective fields and to the folks on the line. Um, so with that, Kater, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Lauren, and to the panelists on behalf of the Ensign and DIU teams, thank you so much for participating in our inaugural uh, IndusX Gurukul uh, series. Um, for the folks that are tuned in, this is not going to be the last time. Uh, our next uh, iteration of the series is actually going to be in person at the IndusX Summit in about uh, 11 days from here. So uh, we're looking forward to being in India and having this event and you know educating startups on our next topic, which... Uh, it's going to be a combination probably of, you know, ITAR's uh, limitations, which uh, I know some of the panelists brought up here today, along with intellectual property. So um, to stay tuned for that. And if you're in New Delhi uh, on February 20th, please stop by uh, uh, and uh, come and join the session. But again, on behalf of the Ensign and DIU teams, thank you so much for tuning in to this event. Uh, and we're looking forward to the future collaboration between both countries. So have a great day and great evening for the folks who are in India. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.